Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure and honor to again welcome you to the presidential uh, lecture series. We are delighted that uh, our guest lecturer is with us today, and we are delighted you that you, our students, are are here, and that our colleagues, members of the faculty and ad administration, we thank you for your presence. I would like to remind all of you in this audience that you are in a great place. You are in a great place. Where else could you, our wonderful students, 
have an opportunity to meet someone like the distinguished Tony Brown. Although many of you have seen him on television, but he is live and in color. We're at Medgar Evers College. And you can leave here today and tell all your friends as you travel to your homes and to your work that you had the opportunity to sit in an auditorium and to hear a great man. And so, uh, prior to my doing the wonderful introduction of this great man, it is my pleasure and honor to ask Dr. Phyllis Curtis Tweed, who is director of the freshman year program, to bring moments of reflections, Dr. Tweed. Good afternoon, Medgar men and women. You know, since the early 1990s, Medgar Evers College has heard from a variety of distinguished speakers in the context of the presidential lecture series. And you should know that this presidential lecture series was conceived, the brainchild, of our visionary leader, the Reverend Dr. Edison O. Jackson, who in keeping with the mission of the college, wanted to develop a program that would promote intellectual curiosity, political engagement, and social commitment. The first audience being freshmen, incoming students to the college, and now attracting a college-wide audience and members of the community. From the program's inception, it was organized and directed by a very special person who unfortunately is no longer with us, and that was the Professor Alexander Barton Page. Have you ever seen New Jack City? You're right. Well, he was in that movie. Uh, that was just one of his many roles. And he was also a poet, and he had a deep commitment to the student population of Medgar Evers College. And so because of that, and to lift up his spirit and the spirit of all of you, I chose to uh, share a short poem from Professor Barton Page that I think attests to his great love for you, our Medgar men and women, and also speaks to the goals of the Presidential Lecture Series. And so this poem is called Love Yourself. Learn to love yourself as I have learned to love me. What you seek is not in the stars nor in others, but inside. Learn to depend on yourself. There is no greater source than that which brews within you, giving strength and building tools. Learn to enjoy yourself. Find happiness within. Unless you rid the evil, sadness will forever contend. Learn to love you as I have learned to love me. Seek not in the stars, nor in others, but deep inside. Thank you. There is a method to our madness. You've heard a poem read, Learn to Love Yourself. And then we heard that if you understand, you got a light, and you ought to let it shine. And then if you know you got a light and you're loving yourself, you can be anything that you want to be. But you got to love yourself first. And so we know that you love your, yourselves because you're here at Medgar pursuing a higher education. And you know that you want to transform your life.
and that is why one of the reasons why we are here today. Our distinguished lecturer, has been so honored as the Educator of the Year, Communicator of the Year, Ambassador of Free Enterprise Award. He is a TV journalist, commentator, a self-help advocate, radio talk show host, keynote speaker, media, entrepreneur, film director, and for me, most importantly, an educator. He has distinguished himself in the media, producer, best-selling author, television commentator, and film director, and he has entered the history books, not only in the era of civil rights, where he coordinated the largest march in history that was led by the late Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., but also in the field of education. He was the first and founding dean, as well as professor of the School of Communication at Howard University, where he established a highly distinguished academic and professional record. This unique accomplishment was recently enhanced by his appointment as the first dean of the Scripp Howard School of Journalism and Communication at Hampton University. Our guest lecturer, Dean Tony Brown, is the commentator of the PBS series, Tony Brown Journal, the longest running of all PBS series. I said the longest running. <laughs> Recently, uh, Dean Brown also became the first recipient of the National Director Legacy Award for Journalism from the United States Department of Commerce Minority Business Development Agency. You have his bio. It is distinguished. And when I grow up, I want to be just like him. Uh, Dean Brown also founded the annual held Black College Day in 1980 and, and as an honorary chairperson of the National Organization of Black College Alumni Incorporated Spearheads, a movement to preserve black colleges. The United States Congress has officially designated Brown's Choice the last Monday in September as a national observance. His community activities include members of the Board of Trustees of Shaw Divinity School, members of the National African American, rather, Slavery Memorial Advisory Board, advisor to the Harvard Foundation for Intercultural and Race Relations, and the Board of Directors of, of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Dean Brown was born in Charleston, West Virginia where he graduated from Garnett High School. He received his bachelor's degree in sociology and a master's degree in psychiatric social work at Wayne State University in Detroit. He has received numerous honorary doctorate degrees from his, for his achievement and achievements in civil rights, education, economics, and journalism. This distinguished lecturer has as his motto self-help, his call to action is very explicit. No black lies, no white lies, only the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to present to some and to introduce to others our distinguished guest lecturer for this day the Honorable 
the great, the educator, the journalist, the producer, you name it, the wonderful Tony Brown. May God grant me the words to speak his thoughts. <clears throat> I'd like to thank you very much for attending today. And as I was looking out at uh, the young faces and the people who are interested in growth, and I know you're interested in improving yourselves because of your presence at Medgar Evers, I was thinking about what the most appropriate angle would be to focus on with this audience. And as our esteemed president, President Jackson, uh, led me to the truth. And I'd like to begin with what I know is the truth. I know that I met the president about a year ago when I taped my television show and I invited him as a guest. I had never met him before, personally. I knew of him. And he was so impressive, and I learned of him to some extent in a very, very fine article in the New York Times. And it focused on a program that he was running here at the college to help our youth become productive citizens, to help them have the same kind of opportunity that many of us have had. And I was just impressed with him. The audience, our national audience, was impressed with him. I didn't know at that moment what I was reacting to, but I was reacting to something. When I arrived here today, I met a young lady who is outside, I believe. Her name is Cheryl Cooley. Cheryl Cooley introduced herself, said that she was with the committee that was sponsoring this event, was very helpful to me. She said, I'd like to help you with your books. And she, began to take the books and display them. She helped me find uh, the people, appropriate people here, and she was just instinctively a person who was accommodating. That young lady showed me what I had already seen in the president of Medgar Evers. It's a word that you've heard bantied around called character. Character. You know, people in America say we have a high unemployment rate, that we can't find enough people, uh, can't find enough jobs in the workforce. Do you know what people hardly ever tell you? Employers hardly ever mention to you that yes, they're looking for people with skills, good GPAs. They're looking for people with um, off the chart achievements. But do you know what they're really looking for? They're really looking for character. And do you know what's so amazing? Most people don't know what character is. We really think we're here at Medgar Evers or we're at Hampton or we're at Harvard or wherever we are so we can learn history and science and physics and journalism. Ladies and gentlemen, you know why you're in a room with other people? Because you're trying to develop character. Do you know what you are really down when you break yourself down scientifically? You're nothing but atoms, and every atom in your body is moving at a high velocity. And you know why it's moving at a high velocity? Because every atom in your body is trying to hook up with every other atom in your body. And every human being's atoms are trying to hook up with every other human being's atoms. And if you magnify that by the world, you will see that every human being is trying to find every other human being so they can hook up with them because do you know what we really are? We are a human family in search of itself. And ladies and gentlemen, when you learn that, you have defeated racism. If you think you're going to the polls and outvote racism, if you think you're going to read a book and outlearn racism, if you think you're going to run fast and get a trophy and outdistance racism, you don't know what racism is. Racism is not about white people and black people. White people and black people don't constitute racism. White people and black people who hate one another constitute ignorance. 
And as long as there is ignorance in the world, there will be racialism. And as long as racialism is present in the world, there will be racism, both of which are manifestations of ignorance. I offer this evidence. I offer the premise that we don't have a race problem in America. We have a reasoning problem in America. Go to your anthropology department. Read any anthropologist. And what will an anthropologist tell you? Every human being in the world is descended from someone from al land. Where is al land? That's what the Romans renamed as Africa. That's where all the folks are from, not just you who call yourselves Afro-Americans, African-Americans, African. The whole world is comprised of nothing but one group, and that's Africans. If everybody is from Africa, everybody in the world is an African. But they don't teach you that. They give you the evidence. No anthropologist will tell you that everybody in the world is not descended from Africa. They will all tell you yes, but they won't make the connection that everybody who's called other things are African as well. And we don't question that. We've come up with four different races, four races, black, brown, yellow, and white. And we with a straight face. And then we got folks, ladies and gentlemen, who now say they're in the mixed race. Well, I want to ask you two things. Find me one black person in the world who's not mixed, and certainly not in the United States. Just one. And find me one Caucasian who doesn't have African DNA. Not two, one. Just one. And go to any anthropologist and find out if I'm telling you the truth. Find any evolutionary biologist or anthropologist and ask them if race is not a false construction. My, ladies and gentlemen, ethnicity is African-American. My ancestry is African. My nationality is American. My race is human. And why do I say my race is human? Because I want to be romantic or I want white people to like me? No, I say my race is human because I read because I study, because I know what it is. I know that every human being has 40,000 genes, and I know that out of the 40,000 genes, only six of those 40,000 genes gives us skin color. Therefore, the difference between a so-called black person and white person is a genetic sunburn. <laughs> six genes make you look different. Every organ in your body is the same. They all work the same way. Everybody reproduces in the same manner. Now, if that's true, don't you belong to the same species and or race? But what did they teach you? Tell you the facts. They will not lie to you. But they will not make the connection to humanity. Why is it that we're so quick in America to connect everybody to a race but no one to humanity? Because that's where your rights are derived. All of your rights, ladies and gentlemen, come out of the fact that you are a human being and a child of God or a child of the Supreme One. Whatever you call whatever it is that created everything, that's what we all came from. And ladies and gentlemen, that's where we're all going back to. And the bottom line is, if you don't get that straight, I'll always manipulate you based on your, quote, so-called race. The bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is black people and white people are basically the same. Most of us are average. We have a few geniuses and a liberal sprinkling of fools. <laughs> and as far as somebody perpetuating lies, they can perpetuate them all they want. They can call you anything they want to call you. The bottom line is, as an old African proverb, it's not what you call me, it's what I answer to. And if you and I and if those of you and I who are African-American don't get straight what we are, we'll answer to anything, won't we? If they say, Betty, here I go running. My name's not Betty. I know who I am. I didn't know who I was until my mama taught me. And I'm just like you. The older I get, the smarter my mama becomes. <laughs> and one day I went home and I said, Mama, Mama, they told me in school that we were poor. She said, Son, we are not poor. We're broke. And she said, well, we can do something about that. We can get some money. And she said, you're going to get a lot of money. 
She says, you know why? I said, no, ma'am. She said, because you're going to finish college. You're going to work hard. And you are going to realize that there's nothing that white people have that God didn't give you. And you're going to use everything he gave you to get what you want. And you're going to do it honestly. I said, well, why honestly, mama? She said, because character creates success. Success does not create character. And money, she said to me, is not wealth. It's a byproduct of wealth. Because anything you learn to do that is productive, if you do it well enough and long enough, somebody will reward you with money for doing it. She said, so never go out in the world and say, I want to make a million dollars. Go out in the world and say, I want to do good. I want to help people. I want to show people how well you can play the piano. I want to show people how well you can do with biology. And she said, if you learn those skills, somebody somewhere will have money for you. She said, so don't ever worry about money. Worry about doing good and don't do bad. I said, well, mama, what's the difference between good and bad? You know, I read a study that said 72% of college professors teach their students there's no such thing as good and bad. It's all relative. I mean, under certain circumstances, it's okay to steal. Under other circumstances, it's okay to lie. Under other circumstances, it's okay to take a life because it's all relative. Mama said, that's not true. She said, I'll tell you what the difference is between right and wrong. She said, it is wrong when you do something that only helps you and doesn't help other people. She said, it's right when you, whatever you do benefits you, but it also benefits other people and society. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this maid and dishwasher called Elizabeth Sanford who was and is and will always be my mama, was a maid and a dishwasher who could not help me with sixth grade math. And when I was two months of age, dying of starvation, mama came to my home and my mother, biological mother, who was suffering from what we today probably call postpartum psychosis, answered the door. And when my mother opened the door, mama said to her, I have come for the boy. She took me home, and for the next 12 years of my life, until she died, she nourished me as the blood of her blood. Now, did I just tell you a horror story? Ladies and gentlemen, I just told you the happiest and the most wonderful thing that ever happened in my life, the fact that I was dying. And the fact that I was dying, God sent me an angel. And this angel came and saved my life. Someone said to me, they said, Mr. Brown, I watch you on television. I never knew you were so short. I always say to myself, hell, I'm glad to be alive. In the sanctuary of learning, minds and space merge in a tranquil setting. Glass, air, light, and space for intellects to grow that blossom seeds of knowledge, unfolding in a contemplative world of books, reading, and information. Sturdy, steady, and strong. Creating success, one student at a time. Maker Evers College. Come and learn. The bottom line, you must be able, ladies and gentlemen, with your mind to define your reality. I define my own reality. I've never felt inferior because mama told me I was as good as other people. I always knew I was smart because mama told me I was smart. I always knew I was going to make millions of dollars because mama told me I was. I always knew I shouldn't play with Pee Wee. He's going to get me in trouble, and he did because mama told me not to play with Pee Wee. The bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot name one thing about which mama was wrong because she said you control your life by the choices you make in your life. Listen to this. Look at our society. Look how pitiful we are. A woman said to me one day, she said, Mr. Brown, I've seen you and I, I, I want some advice from you. I said, well, sister, what kind of advice you want? She says, I want you to help me. She says, I'm looking for a man. I said, well, what kind of man you want? She said, well, I want a good looking man. I said, all right, let's get to something serious. She said, okay. She says, I want a man who will be a good parent to our children. I said, that makes sense. And she says, I want a man who will earn a good income. I said, that makes a lot of sense because I'd never seen a woman who wanted a man who didn't have any money. 
And I said, well, what else? She says, well, what do you think I ought to do? I said, I think you should become all of those things. She didn't applaud. And she didn't like what I said. I don't like that. She said, my boyfriend's a liar. I'm not a liar. I said, well, some lying is going on somewhere. And you wouldn't be with him if you weren't a liar too because nature doesn't make any mistakes. Nature gives you exactly what you have become. And look at the world in which we live. We live in a world in which a no good nothing can believe he or she can find the most wonderful mate in the world. Think about that. What in the world, if you're as ugly as I am, what in the world will give you the right to think you can attract Holly Berry to be your woman? Now, let's get serious. You got nothing and I got nothing. What are you and I going to do for one another? And then here's this thing about, well, I'll find somebody who's happy and they'll make me happy. That doesn't work. That's why we're all in divorce court. And then you got two people unhappy, thinking that I'm going to marry somebody else and the other unhappy person is going to make me happy. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want gold, become gold. If you want to attract someone who reads, learn to read. If you want to attract someone who is going to be a good parent, love children. Do you think that you can hate children and attract a mate who loves children? Do you think God and nature are dumb? Do you think you can fool nature? Ladies and gentlemen, you can fool me, I can fool you. But integrity, the definition I have of integrity is, is what you do when you are alone. What do you do when nobody knows what you're doing? That shows you what kind of person you are. And when you're alone, do you think good thoughts? People got this thing about being afraid of going to hell. Don't worry about hell. Don't worry about it. All of us right now have either chosen heaven or hell. You've already made that decision. We right now live in hell or heaven because if you hate and you envy and you despise, you are hell. You don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> and if you love and cherish and respect, you are heaven. I got on the plane uh, yesterday to come here from Hampton, Virginia. I got on the plane in heaven. I brought heaven with me to this microphone. And when I leave today, I'll take heaven wherever I go. I don't, I don't live in hell because I have chosen not to live in hell. I made a choice. So I don't wish anybody any harm. I don't hate anybody white. I don't hate anybody black. I grew up in a society where I could be called a nigger on the street and I'd better keep my mouth shut or run. I grew up in a society where I could not sit next to white people in a school building. I grew up in a society in which they wouldn't let me go in the theater because of the way I look. But do you think I hate the people who did that? Not for one second. Not for one second. And I don't hate them because I understand they didn't know any better. It's like hating a baby for not knowing Einstein's formula for whatever it is. The baby just doesn't know. So why should you use any psychic energy on that? As a matter of fact, I don't use any energy on racism. Somebody said, you want to go to a racism seminar? No, I don't go to them because I know what a racist is. A racist is a person who hates a whole group of people to make him or her feel good about themselves. They are so inadequate, they're so inferior, that they need to dump on a whole group of folks. Now what in the world are you logically gonna do explaining to somebody that ignorant? I was out at the mental hospital last week. Guy walked up to me and said, hey man, I'm Napoleon. I said, have a nice day. <laughs> There's nothing I can do for that fool. I said, well, when you get home tonight, tell Josephine I said hello. <laughs> I don't waste any time trying to convince anybody how good I am and I'm as good as you. I just show them how good I am Matter of fact, I just show them what my mama taught me and told me I was. And that's always been good enough for me. I never wanted to go anywhere people didn't like me. Mama said, they put something in your food. Don't go around them. <laughs> the bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is you're all you need. And all you need to do, you don't need a savior. You need understanding. What you need to do, I got students at, at my university who are paying enormous sums of money. 
$30,000 a year. And when I catch one of them, they can't pass me in the hall unless we talk about the GPA. I hound them in their sleep. So I say to them, I said, look, you may not care about yourself, but what about your mom and daddy home breaking their backs, working three jobs, paying your tuition? You ought to have at least enough respect for them to make A's and B's. And then here the instructor is three minutes late. They sneaking out the other door. I said, I'm going to ask you a question. How much do you pay per class? Multiple, divide the number of hours you're taking into this $30,000 and tell me how much did this course t cost you? $5,000. And you're sneaking out of the course giggling? You're paying $5,000 for something you're not getting and you think you're getting over? They got a pool room here. They got a, 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 a card uh, room. They got all this other nonsense. And somebody's sitting up in there all day, eight hours a day, cussing white people out because they can't get a job and cussing out the professor because he told them they had to read a book. Tell me, give me the logic. Tell me why you want to come here and spend your day doing nothing. You could do it for nothing out on the corner. You're looking for a boyfriend, you can find him anywhere. The bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, be rational about this opportunity you have. You have a chance to get ahead of everybody. And it's up to you whether you do it or not. I don't care how much President Jackson or your teachers or I talk about how hard you should study. Quite frankly, I don't care whether you study or not. I got mine. <laughs> you can do what you want to do. If you want to be a failure, I don't get in your way. You got a right to be a failure. But I don't think it's very smart. I think you got a chance to do more and more. Then we got this thing about our white man didn't win three weeks ago. Kerry lost. Now, Kerry hadn't been in a black church in 30 years. He was in five black pulpits the last five weeks of the election telling you that there were more black men in jail than in college. You didn't know that? I had it on TV a year ago. Now, he's telling you that because he wants to imply that if he gets to be president, he's going to do something about them being in jail. Do you think Bush or Kerry can do anything about all those black men being in jail? Do you think Bush or Kerry can do anything about what Kerry keeps talking about? 50% of black men in New York City are unemployed. You know why they're unemployed? Because they're not over here at Medgar Evers. And if they had been here, they wouldn't be in jail because they would have some skills to sell. So what is our answer? Carry a bush or come into Medgar Evers? The bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is you can call people names until you green in the face. But the bottom line is nobody else can do your homework for you. Nobody else can roll you out of bed in the morning and get you where you're supposed to be at 8 o'clock. Nobody can get you through a J-O-B. Nobody can do for you what you refuse to do for yourself. Don't be conned by anybody else. Don't let anybody make you believe somehow because you got more melanin than somebody else that there's something they can do. And I'm tired of white people telling me, uh, oh, yes, I would do this, but you know, you, know, you black men are black, and uh, your prostate cancer rating is six, but if you were white, it would only have to be five. No, I know people with six are dying. I don't want a six. I don't want you to tell me I got a six because I'm black. I don't have a six because I'm black. I got a six because I eat meat. I got a six because I use dope. I got a six because I eat salt and sugar. I got a six because I eat fat. That's why my prostate is killing me. And if I stopped eating that and started eating fruit and vegetables and drinking more water and exercising, I wouldn't have that. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't have information, you're somebody's victim. Please understand this. Somebody's going to have you because we live in a society that sells information. I want to ask you a question. You ever heard of Viagra? <laughs> and you're not even 50 yet. You know what Viagra does for men. Doesn't do it for women. Does it for men. You know what it does. Now, the bottom line is, what is the main ingredient in Niagara? Any science majors in here? What is the main ingredient? When you buy Viagra, what are you buying? First of all, you got to go to a doctor and give the doctor two or three hundred dollars for a prescription. Then you got to go to a store, and I don't, I don't use that stuff. I just have to read about it now. <laughs> then, <laughs> then, then you have to, then you have to go to a store and spend ten or twenty dollars for each pill. You're out five or six hundred dollars for a month's supply. And what are you buying? You're buying nitric oxide. N-I-T-R-I-C, oxide. That's what you're buying. 
Now, if you, you've heard about this new black medicine they got that will cut heart attacks, or they announced it last week. The, the Journal of the New England Journal of Science just had this big article, had this great story, and I want all you black folks to know that uh, they've got a new pill that will be out next year that will cut heart attacks among blacks like zip. Blacks now got almost three times the heart attack rate that whites have, almost three times. And that's because the body of blacks genetically will not metabolize as efficiently nitric oxide. So if you put hydrazoline together with nitric oxide, it speeds up the metabolism and then nitric oxide works as efficiently in the black body as it does in the white body. Now, so they got a new miracle drug. Doesn't work that efficiently in whites because whites don't need the metabolism, but it helps blacks, cuts down heart disease and all that. What is the main ingredient now in this new drug? Nitric oxide. You get the drift? Now you're gonna line up from here to the river buying that heart medicine. Now you know what happens to a lot of men? The current medicine for high blood pressure inhibits libido. So men who take it, and some many women, lose their sex drive when they take high blood pressure medicine. So they stop taking their high blood pressure medicine so they can get their sex drive back. Then they have a heart attack or a stroke. <laughs> now, here's my formula for everybody. Nitric oxide is most plentiful in an amino acid that your body produces named arginine. A-R-G-I-N-I-N-E. L-arginine. That's where nitric oxide comes from. So you could go down to the corner store for $6.99 and get you a month's supply of arginine. And ladies, arginine works in women the same way it works in men. And it is safe and it is cheap. No side effect. Oh, there's one side effect. One side effect of arginine. It burns fat cells, creates growth hormone. So you, you lose fat and you get libido. Now you can only do that if you know that you're buying nitric oxide. Information, ladies and gentlemen, is power. That's why you're here. And every time you don't go to class, there's information that you don't get. And every time you go to class, you get light years ahead of everybody who doesn't. And don't let anybody tell you that you come from a culture that has something wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with our culture. There was something wrong with slavery, and there was something wrong with discrimination because it taught us bad habits. And the slave owners wouldn't let us live unless we lived with bad habits and dysfunctional family units. It was forced on us. And after 300 years, we still got some of those memories and residual habits left over, and we carried them with us. We've got to purge ourselves of the bad habits and increase and make it our good habits. What people call race is your culture. That's what it is. And nobody belongs to any different races. It's just that some groups culturally emphasize things that others don't. Among the Asians, particularly the Chinese and Japanese, they emphasize education. That's why they make the highest grades of anybody, whites, blacks, polka dot, or anybody else. In Great Britain, Africans are twice as likely to be a professional than anybody else in Great Britain because Africans in Great Britain emphasize education more than anybody else does in Great Britain. If you go to Harvard, two-thirds of the non-white population student body at Harvard are either black West Indians or Africans because those are the two groups that emphasize education most. Bottom line, whenever you find a group that does something better than any other group, that group emphasizes it. Blacks dominate basketball because a large percentage of our population lives in urban areas and they can't be hockey stars because there's no snow. <laughs> so they play basketball on the cement and therefore we become better basketball stars other than those five who went over to the Olympics uh, got had all that money and they were just too lazy to play. 
bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, your culture is nothing but a result of the adaptation that your group has made. You're not better and you're not worse. And anything you don't know, you can learn. Your culture is perfect. You simply have to emphasize the better aspects of your culture and throw out the worst aspects of your culture. And you can do that. You can do it by developing character. You can do it by emphasizing character. You can do it by understanding that the greatest gift you've ever had is your parents. It may take you all of your life to realize that. You may not like your mom and your daddy now. They may not be perfect, and they aren't. But the bottom line is they got a whole lot of assets that you're not going to realize until you're much older in life. The bottom line is you take a good look at African Americans and take a look at some of our habits. Have you ever seen, uh, i give you an example of cultural habit. I spoke uh, recently in a black church and just before I got there, the preacher had been fired for some unspoken indiscretion. And the preacher got up to say goodbye, arrogant, unrepentant. He said, Jesus brought me here, and Jesus is taking me away. And about that time, the brothers and sisters slowly broke into, oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> now, in academic circles, they call that call and response. You see, in the African, African American community, when uh, we did not speak the English language when we first got here, the one of us who spoke English would learn the words to the song, would give the words, and the rest of us would then repeat the words. And so today in American music, we have solo and backup or chorus. That is someone repeating, call and response. In the black community, when a, 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 a speaker is before a black audience, the audience uh, will help the speaker deliver the message. Mm -hmm. Right on, brother. Get down now. I hear you. <laughs> Watch out. In the general community, uh, the audience will politely punctuate at the end of the applause. Nothing, you, uh, nothing superior or inferior, just we have unique reactions. You ever see two black men greet one another? How you doing? How you doing? What's happening? What's happening? We never answer. <laughs> After all, I can look at him and tell he's catching hell, so we go right on into the conversation. <laughs> and then I was at a, out at a, a, a big dinner, 2,000 people, black people from the inner city out in San Francisco recently, and they were all pretty with the new dresses and suits. The first time they'd been downtown, this big fancy hotel. And so I was at the podium and I saw this one man going from table to table. He went to table 319, table 14, table 562, and I hit the brother next to me and I said, who's that? He's by far the most popular person in the room. And the man said, that's Scotty. I said, well, what's he doing? He said, Scotty brought the hot sauce. <laughs> now, somehow they knew the food wasn't going to be right. So Scotty brought the hot sauce. Now, the bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is all groups have their own unique behavior patterns. We have ours. We don't have to have a plebiscite to determine what we are. We are what we are. And we have all of the rights in the world to be proud of what we are. Can we be better? A whole lot better. Should we try? Absolutely. And ladies and gentlemen, there is no better way to be better than to go to a great college like Medgar Evers, to go to a place that not only will train you for the practical aspects of life and further academic pursuits, but also nourishes you and cares about you. A faculty that goes out of its way to make sure that you get that extra benefit. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a blessing. The glass is never half empty. The glass is always half full. And we simply, as humans, must come to the realization that we are indeed blessed. It doesn't matter what we physically look like. It doesn't matter what our first language is. The only important thing is we didn't all come over on the same ship, but we're all in the same boat. And thank God women have finally found out where their place is. A woman's place is in the House and the Senate. And one day, the African-American is going to find out where his or her place is, at the top. And you're going to find that out, ladies and gentlemen, only when you go inside yourself and see what you really have as a treasure. 
I have one thing I want to say before I leave. On the flyer inside of your program is a flyer with my picture on it with Martin Luther King Jr. That was the most important, eventful day of my life. I was a youngster right out of college. And on that day, I coordinated that march, which ended up being the largest civil rights march ever held in the United States. It was 66 days before the famous march in Washington on July the 23rd. The bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is that on that day, I met a Martin Luther King who was reluctant. I, being a young man, dumb, immature, seeing the world in terms of celebrities and movie stars, expected Dr. King to be glad-handing and doing all of that frivolous nonsense. He wasn't about that. He was serious. He was about the business of freedom. He knew what it took, and he knew what we had to do to climb that mountain. I did not know on that day that King was somber because a black man who was passing for white named J. Edgar Hoover had circulated rumors about him among his friends. I didn't know that the people who control this country had their own plans for him because he was opposing the Vietnam War. I didn't know that members of his own organization were betraying him. I didn't know he was carrying these burdens. I expected somebody who saw the event the way I saw it. Five years later, the reluctant king in Detroit on June the 23rd had become the defiant king in Memphis, Tennessee on the evening of April the 3rd, 1968. And you know what happened on the morning of April the 4th, 1968. On the evening of April the 3rd, 1968, he preached his own funeral. He left us with the idea that he didn't want his children to be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. He told us that he would never see the promised land, although he had been to the mountaintop and he had looked over. He said, I will never see the promised land. He said, but that doesn't matter. It is absolutely not important. I have done what I should do. I have loved. I have spread this love. I have shown the world what goodness is. I am heaven, and I live in it, and I will live in it eternally, because that is the only future for people who are good. Therefore, I don't care about death. He looked death in the face and defied it, because King had become wise enough to understand that we cannot die. We are eternal. And he knew it. He realized it. So he came to be the inspired king on April the 4th on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel when an assassin cut him down with a rifle. And he did not kill Dr. King because you can't kill goodness. You can't kill character. You can't kill love. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't care what happens in the world. I got my mama. And she will always be with me because I have become my mama. The bottom line is, become good. Good. That doesn't have to be religious. It just has to be good. Become, ladies and gentlemen, something that you're proud of. Leave something that will make other people inspired. You don't have to have money. You don't have to belong to any one of the so-called bogus races. You just have to demonstrate that you've got everything you need and you've learned to love. In a way, I envy you and in a way, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes for all the tea in China. I love my life, but I don't want to live it again. Once was enough. I am now, through the deeds 
I am able to commit that are good. Every good deed I commit, I place one brick in my mansion in heaven. I am building my home, and that's where I will go for eternity. If I were to fire a gun in this room, a bullet would come out of the chamber. Would you duck? You would duck, but you couldn't see the bullet. The bullet would be invisible to your eye, but you would duck. And do you know what that means? That means that there is a reality that you acknowledge that's not visible. There's a world that you can't touch or see. And that world, ladies and gentlemen, is where you're going, and that's where you came from. That's the real world. This is the tune-up. So we're not going to come through here and do bad things and get away with it. I don't care what you belong to. I don't care what oath you take. You're not going to fool God. Whatever you do is going to meet you when you make your transition. And that'll be the heaven or hell you have made for yourself here on earth. And I leave you this challenge. And this challenge comes from a poem called Flanders Field. And Flanders Field is a graveyard in Europe in which many of the American dead from World War I are buried. And the poem was written to remind those men who came back from that great war of the tremendous sacrifice those dead men made. And it goes like this. To you from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies blow in Flanders Field. God bless you. Summertime and the living is easy. Fish jumping and the cotton is high oh your daddy's rich and your mama's good looking about it every night and 